question and answer segment. Uh, let's go ahead and begin. We don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, the first, and by the way, I apologize for not uh, seeing those questions last Sunday. So I'm going to try to answer those questions first today. So again, I appreciate your patience on that. Uh, the first question uh, is about Numbers 23.10, and it says, uh, well, I'll read the verse, Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. And the uh, listener is asking, what is the fourth part of Israel? And thank you for that question. Um, these two words, of the fourth and then part of Israel, the of the fourth is Strong's number 7255, and Israel, part, uh, it's, it's really just the term Israel, it's uh, 3478. Uh, and Israel can refer to Jacob's new name that God gave him uh, to the nation as a whole, to the elect, as well as to Christ, uh, etc. But let's focus in on this term of the fourth, which is again Strong's number 7255. We only find it in one other passage, and that is in 2 Kings 625. I'll read that. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And the fourth part uh, is uh, this word, 7255. Now, uh, I'd like you to make a note of that verse, because I'm going to refer to it a little further on in, in, the, in, the, in the study. Uh, the root or parent word for 7255 is identically spelled, and it's uh, 7251. And it appears in 12 verses as square or squared, and predominantly it's found as four square. And it's used to describe various pieces of furniture within the temple, and as well as outside of the temple, and these include the altar, the breastplate, the incense altar, uh, doors and posts, and the outside court, etc. Um, here are a few illustrations of how God uses this. Uh, in Exodus 21, I'm sorry, 27, 1, it describes the altar. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood five cubits long and five cubits broad, the altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. Uh, then referring to the breastplate, and this ties into a question that we got about a month ago about the breastplate in particular as far as the spiritual significance of that being doubled. Uh, Exodus 28, 16, explains four square, it, sh it shall be being doubled a span, shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. Uh, then in Exodus 37, 25, the incense altar is in view, and he made the incense altar of shittim wood, the length of it was a cubit, and the breadth of it a cubit. It was four square, and two cubits was the height of it. The horns thereof were of the same. Uh, 1 Kings 7, 5 also mentions the doors and posts, and all the doors and posts were square with the windows, and light was against light in three ranks. And then lastly, in Ezekiel 40, 47, uh, it talks about the court. So he measured the court and 100 cubits long and 100 cubits broad, four square. And the altar that was 
before the house. Now I want to just return, as I mentioned, to 2 Kings 6.25. I'll read that again. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. What, what's interesting uh, about this listener's question has to do, uh, that has to do with Numbers 23.10, which incidentally ties into what we've been studying uh, in our Second Peter series about Balaam and the donkey. And we know that Numbers chapter 22, 23, 24, all have to do with Balaam's prophecies of blessing upon Israel under divine inspiration, even though he was an unsaved man, to the extreme disappointment and frustration of Balak, the king of the Moabites at, at that time. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the term of a cab of dung, of dove dung, of a cab, which is Strong's number 6894, and the cab is a dry measure, apparently, maybe 1.5 liters, so this would be a quarter of that. Not that that makes any difference, but uh, this verse is speaking about the fourth part of a cab, uh, which was sold at a very high price because of this grievous famine that was taking place uh, in Samaria. And the reason this is significant is because this term of a cab is only found in this verse, but amazingly, its root word, uh, which is, uh, cab is, just like it sounds almost with a Q in front of it, uh, but its root word is kebab, which is 6895. And it only appears in Numbers chapters 22, 23, and 24 in eight passages, and in each of these eight passages, it's the expression curse. Uh, as Balak had employed Balaam to curse Israel, that was his whole motivation and intent. Uh, in Numbers 22, 11 and 17, we read, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. Verse 17, For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. Same thing in Numbers 23. Here it shows up in verse, uh, verses 8, 11, 13, 25, and 27. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom Jehovah hath not defied? And Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them all together. And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place, from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and shalt not see them all. And curse me them from thence. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. Peradventure it, it will please God that thou mayest curse me then from thence. And then the last citation is Numbers 24.10. And Balak Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I call thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Now, getting back to the listener's initial question, I think we can understand uh, that this is referring to the elect. The, the fourth uh, of Israel in the first instance. Uh, as they are, 
as the elect are citizens of the kingdom of God, uh, as we see, for example, in Revelation 21, uh, 16, uh, where we find this word foursquare. And the city lieth foursquare, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And by the way, the number four also surfaces in this uh, fantastic description of the glory of God that we find in Ezekiel chapter one, having to do with the four living creatures. And in verse 10, we, we see that they have four uh, faces. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So thank you very much uh, for that uh, good question. The next question is, is related because uh, about a month ago or more, we received this uh, question from a listener. Why is Aaron's breastplate doubled up in Exodus uh, 39 and 9? And could this have to do with Christ being uh, uh, typified by the rock being struck twice, having to do that Christ came under the, the judgment of God prior to the foundation of the world, and then he had to demonstrate that or manifest that in 33 AD as the events leading up to the cross and then the cross itself uh, and, ev and everything associated with that. And uh, I'll go ahead and read Exodus uh, 39, 8 through 9 again. And he made the breastplate of cunning work, like the work of the ephod. The breastplate, by the way, is Strong's number 38, 33 of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen. It was four square. They made the breastplate double. And this word double is 3717. A span was the length thereof, and a span the breadth thereof, being double. Again, 3717. We find it twice. And I think with what the uh, first question uh, revealed today, at least to me, uh, I think this is, is uh, uh, helpful as, as we see how God uh, uses this uh, word. Uh, let's look again at Exodus 28, 16, uh, that uh, with regard to the breastplate of judgment, uh, the two words breastplate and of judgment are only found in Exodus 28, 15, and also in uh, uh, verses 29 to 30. And I, I, I'm also going to read verse 16 because it, it's right in the middle of this as well. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work after the work of the ephod thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twine linen shalt thou make it. Uh, verse 16, four square. This is uh, 72.51, it shall be being double. Uh, a span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. When he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before Jehovah continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before Jehovah. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Excuse me. Sorry about that, I apologize. Um, now, this word foursquare is a key word. Uh, it's uh, identical 
uh, to its derivative, which is 7255. And as I mentioned in the first question, uh, it only surfaces in Numbers 2310 and in 2 Kings 625. Uh, Numbers 2310, who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. And then again in 2 Kings 6.25, And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And we saw where uh, this word uh, of a cab, 6894, is only found um, in this verse, uh, in, in, uh, in 2 Kings 6.25. But its root word uh, is what uh, I mentioned in our first question. That appears in Numbers 22, 23, and 24. And that is always translated uh, as curse eight times. Now, um, I don't want to say this dogmatically, but it would seem to give credence to this idea that Christ became a curse for his elect with regard to the, this breastplate of judgment that is doubled up, or at least it's four square. This four square, as far as I can tell, uh, has to do with this, with, a, with being a curse. And we, we also, um, uh, if, you know, if we go to, let's see, um, if we go to Galatians 3.13, we read about Christ becoming accursed for us. Uh, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And that takes us back to Deuteronomy 21.23. Deuteronomy 21.23. Uh, we read there, now I'll start with verse 22. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he, be to, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, or damned. Uh, that thy land be not defiled, which Jehovah thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So as we think about the breastplate of judgment, number one, it's even in the title of the breastplate. It has to do with judgment. And on the breastplate, they had the uh, 12 stones, precious stones, precious gems, uh, signifying the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And of course, this is on Aaron's heart. Aaron is the high priest. Christ is our high priest as well. And so I think that, you know, we can understand at least, I'm not sure about the word double. I, I, didn't, I didn't really, I haven't made any progress with that particular word. I, I just, um, nothing has, has been opened up to me as far as that goes. But at least with the word foursquare, we can see that there is uh, a direct link uh, to this idea of, of, uh, of curse, of cursing. Just as Balaam was employed, he was hired to curse Israel. And of course, he didn't because God didn't allow him to do that. But nonetheless, this idea of the curse being associated 
with the breastplate as far as this particular word is concerned. So I think we're on the right track with this, but we, we need to do more study. I need to do more study as, as well. Uh, so, but thank you again. I hope that sheds a little further light. Um, all right, let's see. The next question has to do with um, comparing Ezekiel 21.15 and 1 Samuel 21.9. Uh, two questions. Number one, I was also wondering if we can compare Ezekiel 21.15, the sword wrapped up with 1 Samuel 21.9, Goliath's sword wrapped in a cloth. And number two, if Goliath typified Satan, could the bad men be the ten sons of Satan uh, remaining to be killed after Satan was deposed? And I think uh, you're referring to the, the great men in Ezekiel 21, 15. I'll read Ezekiel 21, uh, 9 through 15, and then we'll read the first Samuel passage. A son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith Jehovah say a sword, a sword is sharpened and also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. It is furbished that it may glitter. Should we then make mirth? It condemneth the rod of my son as every tree. And he hath given it to be furbished that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened and it is furbished to give it into the hand of the slayer cry and howl, son of man, for it shall be upon my people. It shall be upon all the princes of Israel. Terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people. Smite therefore upon thy thigh, because it is a trial. And what if the sword condemn, contemn even the rod? It shall be no more, saith the Lord God. Thou therefore, son of man, prophesy and smite thine hands together, and let the sword be doubled the third time, the sword of the slain. It is the sword of the great men that are slain, which entereth into their privy chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates, that their heart may faint, and their ruins be multiplied. Ah. It is made bright. It is wrapped up for the slaughter. And here again, we see the context of judgment uh, beginning with Judah and Jerusalem. And they, um, uh, the ones in view, as we read in verse 12, in number one, he says, upon my people, and then it shall be upon all the princes of Israel. Uh, terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people. Then down in verse 14, it talks about the great men that are slain. And, it, you know, it, it uses the plural against all their gates in verse 15, uh, that their heart may faint and their ruins be multiplied. Uh, in, in 1 Samuel 21, 8 through 9, we read, And David said unto Ahimelech, and is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take it, if, I will t if thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. Now, we have um, two phrases in each of these passages. The, the one in Ezekiel 21, uh, 19 through 15 is, or I'm sorry, uh, Ezekiel 21, 15 um, No, I'm sorry, um, 21.9. Uh, it is wrapped up for the slaughter. Wrapped up is Strong's number 4593. 
and for the slaughter is 2874. And these two words only appear here. Uh, the same is true of uh, what we read uh, in 1 Samuel. No, I'm sorry. Um, it is wrapped up for the slaughter. It has to do with Ezekiel 21, 15. Uh, that is uh, 4593 and 2874. Uh, then in 1 Samuel 21, 9, uh, Behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth. That's 3874 uh, and 8071. And again, both of those, those two words also only appear once. So what we're going to have to do is look at these individually. And I didn't have enough time to do that, so I'm going to work on this some more and probably post this as a, as a doc um, a little later on. Uh, but thank you again uh, for that question. Uh, we do have a few more. Uh, one of these uh, has to do with the period of the judges, uh, which uh, began in 1407 BC and it lasted uh, 360 years until, uh, uh, let's see, I can't even remember the, uh, yeah, 1047 B.C., 360 years, even though in the book of Judges, uh, we, it only deals with about 299 of those years. But the listener was, was saying, how do you reconcile that with 1 Kings 6.1 and Acts 13.20? So I'm going to read those. Um, and it came to pass in the 480th year, this is 1 Kings 6, 1. After the children of Israel will come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. And then in Acts 13, 20, We read, And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And that's a good question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I got this information from Mr. Camping, but I don't remember. Uh, there is a way of, of uh, reconciling this, but I just don't remember what it is. So I'll try to look that up and find out uh, how he was able to reconcile it because I know he covered that in at least one or two of, of his books. Uh, the other question we got uh, had to do with uh, 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 and 2 Peter 2, uh, 20 to 22. Uh, how does uh, the idea of a soldier tie in with um, a soldier not being entangled in the affairs of this life and those who are entangled, in other words, they go back to the world in 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. So let's read those. Um, 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And then if we go to 2 Peter Two twenty. We read. Um, I'll start with verse eighteen. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped 
from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed uh, to her wallowing in the mire. So as far as uh, in, in 2 Timothy, we, we see here uh, where a, 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 a believer is to be a good soldier. And, and part of that involves uh, discipline. It also involves um, the obedience to authority. And this, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the, uh, the, the role of the soldier and the role of the believer is to be single-minded uh, in, in the mission that it lies uh, before, before us. Whatever, during the, during the time of the, uh, the day of salvation, what was the mission? The mission was to get the gospel into the world. That, that was the primary focus. Everything was um, uh, to, to uh, make that a, a possibility, to, to, to strive to do whatever was necessary to, as God allowed, of course, under his direction, but that was where people were to place their time and their talents and, and their finances to make, to fulfill the Great Commission. Now we have another commission. We have the commission of feeding sheep. And so in the same way, we want to be able to uh, do everything we can in our power, again, as God allows, to, to do that very thing. Uh, and, you know, a, a good example, I think, uh, is Uriah the Hittite. Um, you know, David tried, because of David's sin, he tried to, uh, you know, get him drunk, try to get him to go down to his house and lie with his wife. But Uriah, regardless of all of that, never left, you know. And he told David, he goes, you know, uh, Joab is out in the field with, with the army of Israel and they're encamped in tents, okay? And should I go down to my house and, and lie with my wife and do this or do that? And he stayed by the palace. Uh, and of course, that was the, uh, the reason why David ultimately wanted to get him killed, okay? But he demonstrated something important and that is, he demonstrated uh, purpose. He, he demonstrated single-mindedness uh, in the tasks that he felt he was called to do. Uh, now, uh, on the other hand, that, that has to do with a believer. Now, on the other hand, in 2 Peter 2, uh, we have, of course, this is speaking about false prophets and who they influence and, and, and what they're doing uh, to allure them through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Uh, and so, uh, again, these are people that are in name only, uh, where they decided to jump onto the, the gospel bandwagon, so to speak, but yet they never truly became saved. And it's very much, you know, like what we read in Matthew 13, having to do uh, with the sower and the seed. We have the seed that falls on the ground where there is not much uh, dirt, and so it's not able to take root. We have another seed uh, that falls, and the birds, the fowls of the air come down, and they immediately pluck up the seed, they eat the seed, so that it doesn't even have time to get into the ground. And then we have another uh, example where the seed actually makes it to the ground and it actually starts to grow a bit, 
but then the weeds uh, choke the, the plant and it becomes unfruitful. It, it's going to die. All three examples die. That, that's the bottom line. The only one that doesn't die is the one that was genuine, that God planted in the soil of a person's heart uh, during the day of salvation, and it grew and flourished so that it bore fruit. Uh, what is it? 30, 60, 100 fold. Uh, and so uh, this, this is the difference between those that are in name only, and particularly now as we're living in the day of judgment and we're undergoing uh, a fiery trial. This trial is going to separate, you know, the, the silver and the gold and the precious stones from the wood, hay, and stubble. And so we see this falling away, this falling backwards, this turning back like Lot's wife. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, in Hebrews we find the admonition uh, that, we're, that we're not to turn back, that that's never a good place to be. It's always looking forward to the kingdom of God and, and in obedience to what God would have us to do. And so because of that, then we, we find uh, this uh, warning in verses uh, 21 and 22, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And the turning is not the turning of repentance during the day of salvation, which is salvation, but it's a turning away from the word of God. And it's going backwards. And when you read about backwards in the Bible, it's never a good thing. Eli, the high priest, fell over backwards and his neck broke. And this is a picture of judgment. And the same idea here, uh, verse 22, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You know, you can, uh, uh, you can clean up the pig, you can wash him, you know, put a pretty bow on his head, whatever. Okay, he's still a pig. He's going to go right back into the mire, right back into the mud, because that is his nature. And that cannot be changed unless God changes. And, and this is, I think, what's, what's in view here. Um, all right, thank you again. That was a great question. Uh, we have one more question as far as I know, uh, and that is, can you comment on verse 23 of Matthew 10? What is the Lord saying, flee yet into another city? What is meant by cities or cities? Uh, Matthew 10, 23. Let's see, um, I'll start with verse 21 uh, and read down to verse 25, I think. Um, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father, the, ch the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? And, you know, I'm sorry, but I've never worked on this passage, so I think I'm going to have to withhold and, and, and work on this to do further study. Um, but thank you very much. 
I, and I'm not sure if we have any other questions. All right, we'll just wait a few minutes. I, I want to make sure that we don't uh, leave anybody out. All right, apparently we, we don't have any other questions, so uh, let's, maybe we could play a hymn. We'll, we'll play one hymn just to uh, give everybody the benefit of the doubt, and then if we don't have any other questions, then, then we'll close in prayer. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions uh, today, so let's close in a word of prayer. 
Father, again, we thank you that we uh, were able to uh, read these uh, verses. Uh, these, we thank you for these questions. We, uh, again, thank you for your word, which is indeed a light unto our path uh, and a lamp unto our feet. Father, we pray that you would continue to shine that light, the, the light of, of the understanding that you alone can give uh, in each of our lives. Uh, Father, as we meditate upon your word and as we study your word and read your word, uh, we, we thank you, Father, where would we be without the word of God? Uh, it, it truly is our life. And so we, we thank you for giving us uh, this opportunity, this day that we can set aside to focus altogether our attention upon you and our relationship with you and upon your word. We commit uh, the rest of this evening into your hands and ask these things with uh, grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for joining us. And if you're able to, we're going to have a, a half hour of thematic uh, Bible reading at 7.30 uh, Pacific time tonight. Hope you can join us. And again, we pray that the Lord will continue to bless uh, your fellowship with him throughout the rest of this day. Thank you for joining us today for Searching the Scriptures. Until next time, to God be the glory.